This episode is sponsored by Kaplan Medical. If you head over to captest.com and use the offer code ITB15, you can get 15% off any Kaplan Medical product. And importantly, for AMA members, you can combine this discount with your AMA membership for a total of 40% off. Welcome to the Inside the Boards podcast, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn to think like a question writer so you can study smarter, not harder, and succeed in medical school. And now here's your host, Patrick Beeman. I am Patrick Beeman, your host. Welcome to the Inside the Boards podcast. This is an archived episode from our 2017 Study Smarter series. I'll be posting the rest of these archived episodes over the next couple weeks. If you've already taken your step one, congratulations, you're done. Breathe a sigh of relief. And for those of you who are just starting med school or entering second year, stay tuned to this channel as we will be posting content to help you throughout your first two years of medical school. Welcome to our Study Smarter series for the USMLE Step 1 and Comlex Level 1. We have Shola Vaughn here, who is, among other things, a dermatology resident, author, host of the Med Student Edge podcast, and you should check that one out. The current episodes offer some guidance on creating mnemonics, prioritizing concepts, using Anki, how much a student should be studying, etc., For the purposes of today's episode, Shola is the main character in what you might call a med education or a med ed success story, which you can read all about on sholamd.com. She was self-admittedly an average undergraduate student and entered med school within the first three months of her first year. She had her first child. And her husband came down with a diagnosis of leukemia. So talk about stress. She then admits in her bio that she struggled during her first year. And of course, who wouldn't? But not to be discouraged and especially relevant for today's show. She discovered a particular study or um, learning technique, applied it to her study and rose to the top of her class by the end of her fourth year. But perhaps most interestingly, in my mind, is that she is a legitimate rock star, right? <laughs> Legit. She should perhaps give a little bit of an overview of what I mean by that. <laughs> well, thanks for having me, Patrick. It's a real pleasure to be featured on your podcast. So yeah, after I graduated from college, like I said, I was a pretty average student. I went to Harvard. So, you know, I thought that I was pretty smart, but I kind of struggled there. And then I decided that, you know, maybe the academic world wasn't for me. So I moved to Los Angeles and I joined a rock band. And then after I left that band, I started my own band. I won't say the name because I don't want people to find me on YouTube. But (laughs) (laughs) but um, I played guitar and I sang and uh, and we did the whole, you know, trying to make it musician thing. So I, um, you know, we toured, we went to. California, Germany, we kind of, you know, played and met all kinds of really inspirational people, um, had a lot of fans, signed a lot of autographs. And then I decided that uh, the rock star life was actually even tougher than medical life. So I um, decided <laughs> to go back to medical school. You know, I see that because uh, uh, one of my favorite bands is Say Anything. And mm. Max Bemis uh, just tweeted today. Uh, this just sad photo of this new band that he's supporting called Backwards Dancer um, with a picture of their van and trailer that oh, uh, said it was stolen along with all their equipment oh, 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 while no. they're on tour. So, like, that's <sighs> tough. That's that's a tough life. Yeah. I mean, it was tough. I, like, you know, I, I was getting older. And, you know, for girls, you always have this biologic clock factor. And <laughs> I just looked around this, like, smelly van with my bandmates. And I thought, I can't have kids in this band van. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that was kind of the end of it. Then I went and took the MCAT. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. As many people, probably it's not exactly a secret. Among other things, I use this podcast to evangelize my favorite music. So... 
to the artists out there and to the the students listening, please support emerging artists, especially um, so that they can build a life that's a little more normal while also pursuing <laughs> creative work. All right, let's let's get into this. So what changed for you in medical school that took you from being an average and struggling student to rising to the top of your class and getting into arguably one of the most competitive specialties in medicine, dermatology? So one of my classmates actually posted in our Facebook group a link to this TED Talk that was done by Joshua Four, where he talked about the memory palace technique. I had heard about it, like some people have heard about it. Sherlock Holmes kind of uses it, he called it the mind palace. And I, but I'd never really given it much thought. And I went and watched this TED talk. It's 20 minutes. And I always tell people that they have to watch this. It's, it's life changing. It's completely changed my life. And the idea behind the memory palace is that humans are wired to be able to remember locations and directions just from an evolutionary standpoint and put that into long-term memory quickly. So for example, you probably haven't been to your childhood home, you know, since maybe you were like eight or 10 years old, mm -hmm. but you can remember the exact layout of every room in that house. Yeah. You know, if I asked you to walk from, you know, in the front door and tell me what was to the left and what was to the right, you'd be able to tell me without having to think about it twice. And if we could basically remember all the factoids that we have to memorize from medical school that same way by linking those new memories to these old memories from our directional memory, that we could memorize things much faster. So the old poets in like Greece used to do this. They would, when they had to memorize these long poems and deliver them, these great orators, they would use the memory palace technique to memorize these long poems. And, you know, so through time, this has been passed down through the generations. And so when I found out that people, you know, there's like this whole cult of memory, these people go to memory competitions and it's amazing. They can memorize a deck of cards in like two minutes. Um, just like random shuffling. And so, you know, when I found out about this, I thought, well, maybe I can use this to, you know, I was kind of struggling and there was so much material to memorize. And so I started using the memory palace technique and it made things so much more manageable, so much easier. And like you said, it, it changed everything for me. So after that, I started performing a lot better on my exams, having to study a lot less. And so now that I'm, you know, a derm resident, I was able to match into the specialty of my dreams. So now I kind of think of it as my calling to share that with other med students, because I feel like I can make their lives easier. You know, people who are, you know, I had a lot of challenges my first year and other people who have challenges, you know, we can, maybe it doesn't have to be so bad. Yeah, absolutely. So they should check out Med Student Edge, the podcast, all one word. And you've got a, a few kind of like short, less than 10 minute tutorials on implementing these techniques, right? Exactly. Awesome. So definitely check that out. And I'll put a link in our show notes as well. But today, since you are a Durham resident, you have been appointed uh, to help us with the skin uh, section of step one. So like usual, we're going to go through some questions and make use of your expertise. Are you ready? I am ready. All right, let's do this. A warm up question. A researcher is investigating epithelial cell junctions. She injects one cell with a liquid dye and notes the dye seeps into the adjacent cell. Which of the following is most likely to have allowed the dye through to the adjacent cell? A. Desmosome. B. Gap junction. C. Hemidesmosome. D. Zona adherens. Or E, the zona occludens. And the answer for this one is B, gap junction. But why is it a gap junction as the answer? What do we need to know about those for the boards? Yeah, so I think it's, this is actually a strange warm up question because I think it's actually pretty tough. Um, <laughs> even as a derm resident, this isn't information that you really use clinically. So oh. it makes it harder to remember things like this. But I think it's important because it, is like a fundamental knowledge of the way that skin works. And I think step one does sometimes just like you to be able to explain some basic physiology. And as far as skin, this is pretty basic physiology. So it is important. Another reason I like this question is because it kind of demonstrates what you've referred to as like the cover up and predict approach, which is that you should be able to look at the question and without necessarily even looking at the answer choices, make a, a pretty educated guess about what the right answer is. So I think when you're reading this question, you can kind of look and say, okay, well, 
you know, what would cause material to leak in, you know, what's responsible, like what kind of uh, junction is responsible for that process. And, you know, guess that you're looking for gap junction before you even look at the, the answer choices. I think that it's important to know that only gap junctions from the list of choices are responsible for communication. And so it's important to know the functions of each cell type when you're looking through the answer choices and know that um, only gap junctions really make sense here. So desmosomes are only for attachment. And that was choice A. So desmosomes, attachment. And hemidesmosomes um, are for anchoring the, the skin to the basement membrane zone. Okay. The zona adherens is also for ad attachment, and the name kind of gives that away, so that's nice. And then the zona occludens is a tight junction that prevents against water loss, and so again, the name kind of gives that one away. So I think even if you don't remember much about uh, the skin, you could probably kind of reason through this one. Yeah, and I think I think your point about gap junctions being the only thing of these answer choices that are involved in communication is probably the underlying principle they want you to know. And that might be, maybe I just guessed it right, but that might have been why I remembered that for some reason when, in fact, I do so little dermatology and anytime, <laughs> uh, anytime somebody comes with a rash other than pruritic urticarial papules and plaques of pregnancy, <laughs> I am at a complete loss. Uh, so, Refer to derm. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. So is this kind of... Let's say you had trouble as a student keeping all this stuff straight. Is this a good question, perhaps provide an example of how you might employ the memory palace technique, or should we save it for another one? Usually I save the memory palace for entities like disease entities or drug entities or like, you know, bugs and drugs. I thought those were the best things. A lot of times concepts do not work well for the memory palace. It's really kind of like buzzword associations. So what I would have in a memory palace is desmosomes and hesmidesmosomes and knowing what disorders they're associated with. And I think we're going to talk a little bit later about blistering disorders, so we'll get into that. All right, perfect. So stay tuned for that. All right, moving on then. We will go to our next question. A 25-year-old man comes to the office because of a growth in his right leg. The patient is HIV positive and says that at first the lesion was flat. However, it has become raised over the past year. In addition, he says another lesion has appeared in his right hip and another on his flank. Physical examination shows a large, raised, well-circumscribed purple lesion on his right upper thigh. Which of the following is the most likely etiology of this patient's condition? And the answer choices are A, Bartonella henseli, B, human herpes virus 8, C, human immunodeficiency virus, D, human papillomavirus, or E, parvovirus. And the answer for this one is B, human herpes virus 8, HHV 8, because this patient has Capuchy sarcoma. Is so that I how learned, you pronounce it? Yes, this is a Is that um, why Hungarian you emphasized name. it like that? Okay. All these <laughs> yes, years. <it's> <laughs> <laughs> My wife tells me I have very uh, idiosyncratic pronunciation of certain words, and I admit that I do, but I feel like I'm just going to stick with those. But I could see myself <laughs> making a change. Capuchy sarcoma? Yes. All right. Perfect. <laughs> I do like this question because... It's such, I feel like as far as boards questions go, this is such an easy to ask, very clear infectious disease question that, you know, it's something that you're likely to see in some manifestation on a step one exam. I think that boards writers like uh, Capuchy because it's one of the few examples in medicine where an infection can cause cancer. And so uh, it's important for people, all people to know about because it illustrates a very fundamental principle. And I also wanted to mention about this question that the human herpes viruses are a great example of memory palace uh, use. So I have a memory palace with all viruses, but the one I built for herpes viruses specifically are in my sister's kitchen. And so I just had them go down the line from one through eight um, and put all the associations, you know, the associations with EBV versus CMV versus varicella and put them in very distinct places so that I never got them confused because they will ask you, you know, to be able to recognize, okay, what is the difference between 
you know, most importantly, HSV1 versus HSV2. And you really need to be able to like quickly remember which one is which. Well, while we're on that subject, let's roll with it. Uh, do you have uh, some good advice on keeping those important boards related distinctions between HSV1 and HSV2? So my palace for the herpes viruses is pretty uh, extensive. extensive. I put a lot of things in there because, you know, as a dermatologist, it's been growing, actually. Yeah. And so uh, I can You've tell had you, to though, demolish that... one of the walls and put in an, an addition. <laughs> yeah. So let's see. I think it's important to know, you know, HSV1, I would just so I put that, you know, on top of my sister's stove in her kitchen and I put all things in there that were oral. So because you really want to remember that HSV1 is the oral one and HSV2 is the sexy one. So inside the, the stove is um, HSV2 for me. And whenever you're building a memory palace and you're having a hard time remembering something, anything that's sexy tends to stick in our memories. So that's a very easy way to make, you know, anytime you're building a mnemonic, you always make it sexy and then you'll remember it better. And so um, trying to associate anything HSV2 with anything sexual um, will also help you remember it. So um, you know, I had a bunch of people in the stove wearing tutus so that I could remember kind of these like sexy tutus. <laughs> so, you know, you have to kind of figure out what works for you. But, you know, those are that's the big thing, I think, is remembering which one is oral and which one is um, genital. I bet you're like if we could enter your memory palaces, they might be kind of interesting to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> everybody should everybody should keep their own memory palaces uh, uh, under lock and key, probably. Oh, if I they're do. to be and effective. <laughs> I put a lot of things that would be get me in a lot of trouble in my memory palaces. <laughs> but see, that, that point you make is actually one that uh, I know Thomas Aquinas himself made about memory and the kind of, I guess, groundwork, um, you know, aside from the Demosthenes of the world and uh, ancient times uh, uh, was in the medievals, this memory palace concept, because the, the monks would... Uh, they didn't have, you know, a printing press, so there was like one book for a whole town, and they had to memorize the entirety of the Bible, essentially. That's a right. thick book. Yeah. <laughs> almost as bad as first aid. <laughs> almost. almost. <laughs> At least the Bible has a narrative. <laughs> but yeah, like Aquinas recognized that there's a certain uh, value when trying to remember something to the sort of like uh, the the violent or odd or or strange or out of the ordinary, you know, probably for him, experiences of life to the you know the absurd essentially or or things that really uh, help stand out or that stand out in life help stick things into the memory. But yeah, exactly. All right, so Capuchin sarcoma. So I think yes. this question illustrates another important point. And granted, this is a pretty straightforward question. But again, this is an audio podcast. And if the vignettes get a, too much longer than this, it can be difficult to follow along. But here's what I want people to recognize. And that is the point that most of the questions on well, all of the questions on um, USMLE and uh, most of them on the Comlex are going to be single best answer. And we kind of gloss over that a lot of times, but what does that really mean? It means that there is a chance that every single answer that you encounter is correct to one degree or another. But the, the answer that will get scored as a point versus those that will not is the one that is the most correct. And in this case, you could conceivably see a vignette where it describes everything um, about Capuchin's sarcoma, excludes the fact that the patient has HIV, and then asks which of the following is the most likely etiology of this patient's condition, and have all these same answer choices. So Bartonella henseli, the uh, human herpes virus 8, HIV, HPV, and parvovirus B19, the answer would still be, the single best answer would be HHV8, even though you could argue, well, I mean, most people who get Capuchis are HIV positive, so therefore isn't HIV also kind of a cause? Well, yeah, it is kind of. But the single best answer is the one that is most specific, and that is going to be HHV-8. Let's see, the other answer, answer choice is HIV. I'm going to just let that one go because we're going to have to devote a whole 
actual episode to covering some high yield facts about HIV because it's such a broad condition. Hey, Patrick, can I ask you a question about yeah. that, that distractor? Yeah. What's your opinion about, you know, if you're taking step one and you see something like this, they've told you the patient has HIV and you're thinking, well, HIV is the cause of their disease, um, like their skin problems. And you're like, this is way too easy. It's way too obvious. Should you follow that instinct? So I actually think that this probably would not pass the review of of the boards, like it would get thrown out as in the test group of questions. I don't know that for a fact. I don't write for the actual USMLE or Comlex. But the reasoning would be one of the guidelines in the NBME's author instructions and the NBOME's is that you can't repeat information from the vignette in the answer choices. Hmm. If you saw a question like that, now there are situations where this, I, I think, probably could not apply, but I just can't think of a good example now. So I would say no. If you do encounter a situation like that, take a second look and realize perhaps you aren't catching something in the vignette, so you need to pause. This is a question you should probably mark, put your answer, and then go back to later, or recognize that it might be experimental, um, and then be like, if you don't know, just write it off as, ah, it's probably experimental, go on, and uh, approach the next question. Does that answer that? Yeah, uh, thanks. HPV, I think, is probably another one we're going to cover separately, but suffice it to say... Really important to remember, HPV 611, cause of genital warts, and that uh, HPV 16 and 18 are primary causes of uh, cervical cancer. Choice E was parvovirus B19, everybody's favorite virus, well, maybe not, mm -hmm. um, but this is the causative agent in erythema infectiosum, which presents with that slapped cheek type rash in a pediatric population and can lead to significant anemia. Next is a 68 year old woman who comes to the emergency department because of large red plaques covering her body. Physical examination shows dramatic blisters on her inner thighs and upper arms. These lesions are pruritic, but they are not painful. Nikolsky sign is negative if I pronounce that correctly, which mm -hmm. of the following is the most likely diagnosis for this patient? A, bolus pemphigoid, B, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, C, epidermolysis bullosa, D, pemphigus foliaceus, or E, pemphigus vulgaris. All right, walk me through this question, because this, this does start to stretch even my step one knowledge. Yeah, and I think that um, we'll talk about the distractors, but it is good not to get too stressed out about entities that you don't recognize at all. Like, I don't think when I was in med school, I'd even heard of pemphigus foliaceus. But... Yeah, I still, uh, this is like the <laughs> second time I've heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So again, I think this is a good, this is a situation where I had a memory palace. And in med school, as far as blistering disorders go, I feel like they want you to be able to tell bullous pemphigoid from pemphigus vulgaris. And like, really, the two are not all that similar. Um, so it's very easy to put one in one room and the other in another room and have kind of the associations really lined up in your mind. So when you think of bullous pemphigoid, that's usually older people. So the 68-year-old woman, that's kind of classic. It's an old woman um, who's real itchy. Um, Nikolsky sign, sign is negative because, as you might remember, in bullous pemphigoid, the antibodies are against um, hemi hemidesmosomes. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of deeper. The bullae then are more tense because they're still anchored above that basement membrane zone, but they're uh, falling apart at that BMZ. And then they also sometimes want you to know there's like linear deposition on um, DIF or direct immunofluorescence. But even that is a little more than what I'd expect an average yeah. med student to know. This vignette is perfect for bullous pemphigoid. The it is very dramatic, the dramatic blisters. Usually in pemphigus vulgaris, on the other hand, things are kind of sloughing off because that process is more superficial. Um, that is autoantibodies against desmoglians which are uh, in more superficial layers of the skin. So it's, a lot of times you don't get intact blisters, you just get these erosions. And then the Kolsky sign, as you remember, it's like when you press the blister, the blister will spread in the direction, you know, kind of 
shear along the skin to spread the blister. And so if Nikolsky sign is positive, that means when you pressure, put pressure on it, it will spread. Um, and when it's negative, it kind of stays intact. And so I, I imagine kind of like pressing on it and it not being able to spread because it's just the hemidesmosome, that's bullous pemphigoid. Whereas in PV, um, it's kind of like all loose. And so the Nikolsky sign, it'll kind of like the blisters will just spread all over and the whole thing will just erode off. That's the one that's a lot more painful. People get it in their mouths more. And so, you know, just thinking about them, they look very different. So what always helped me in med school was to just go, you know, go online and just kind of have a picture in my mind of like a person that had this or read a story about someone that had it, um, because these two look a lot different. Which is very weird, I think, just as a, a commentary on medical education in general, because I've never seen a patient with either bullous pemphigoid or pemphigus vulgaris, but I do remember these two entities. And I do remember the fact that one has negative Nikolsky sign, and that's bullous pemphigoid. One has positive, and that's pemphigus vulgaris. But I think now, uh, being far away from medical school, if a patient presented to me with a blistering disease, it would just immediately be refer to dermatology. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's so weird that we spend a lot of time learning diseases of that nature, because I imagine that they are, while probably not very common, they're, they're more common in, in your patient population, but for the average physician, perhaps not so. Is that true? Yeah, I would agree with that. And it's interesting. I always think about the step one writers imagining <laughs> that they're training a, a, a kind of force of primary care physicians, right? Even though right. that's not what most people will go into ultimately, yeah. but, but just that, okay, what does a primary care doctor need to know about blistering disorder? Well, as a dermatologist, we need you to be able to tell us, is it you know, Nikolsky negative or positive, because that tells us, is it bullous pemphigoid, which is less aggressive and not as worrisome? Or is it pemphigus vulgaris, which is usually a lot more severe, can be drug induced and can progress rapidly. So, you know, that's, that's really all you need to know, like from our standpoint. I think that is important um, that med students just have that association, just like knee jerk reflex. That'll probably get you everywhere you need to go on a derm question like this. Okay, fair enough. Do you think it's important for students um, to know epidermolysis bullosa? Yeah, so I was going to say about the distractors. So Ehlers-Danlos doesn't blister. So that's a real easy, oh, you know, yeah. if you can kind of remember that, that's an easy rule out. Epidermolysis bullosa is important to know about, but it's always, as far as step one is concerned, you'll see that in kids. Um, you know, it's, it's very severe and they can get kind of like a chronic scarring and they get like, you know, glove mitten deformities, but you'll see it. It'll only ask about it in kids. Is this, does this go by another name? Like, is this toxic no. epidermic necrolysis? No, it's not. No, it's different. Okay. So SJS intense Steven Johnson syndrome and toxic uh, epidermal necrolysis, those we do see in more in adults, actually, and uh, somewhat older children. And those are those are like the derm emergency. That's what, like the one thing that the people always think. The one thing you have to get. <laughs> or, which is not true. That's a total myth. But uh, this is a different entity. Okay. And then pemphigus foliaceus. Yes, let's just not even stress people out with having to know what this is. You, if you get this, don't choose it. Here's They're not <laughs> asking about this. <laughs> okay. And, and if they do, and that's the one thing you're stumped on, just be happy. <laughs> yeah, right. right? Um, if you want to learn more about pemphigus foliaceus, consider a career in dermatology. A 64-year-old man comes to the dermatology clinic because of a pearly and translucent lesion on his nose. Physical examination shows overlying telangiectasia on the affected area. A skin biopsy is performed and shows a nodular growth pattern. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? A. Basal cell carcinoma. B. Melanoma. C. Pyogenic granuloma. D. Squamous cell carcinoma. Or E syringoma? And the answer for this is A, basal cell carcinoma. So I remember looking at the chart in step one and thinking, all right, I got to remember this one's got telangiectasias, this one's kind of like pearly and, and trying to uh, memorize that. But what are the features of this vignette that are reliable things you can keep in your memory, take with you on exam day and get questions right? related to skin cancers. 
Yeah. And so, Patrick, I think your your recommendation, again, is to look at this question and read the last question first, right? That's kind of how you re- recommend people approach these. Yes, because one of the the things that question writers have to do is write a question for which you don't need any additional information provided within the answer choices to arrive at uh, the correctly scored answer. So you should be able to cover the answers and come up with information only from the vignette, um, the correct answer. That That's not necessarily saying you might remember the the correct answer or even that you'd come up with an answer that is actually correct but isn't included in the distractors because that can happen but the point is you should be able to get all the information to arrive at it without looking at additional information in the answer choices if that makes sense yeah absolutely so yeah cover the answers so which of the following is the most likely diagnosis after seeing this guy with a pearly translucent lesion on his nose with an overlying telangiectasia yeah and so again you know we kind of talk about i imagine you know this like this you know new class of primary care doctors really needing to understand some basics about the skin and so this is like a fundamental can you tell the difference between a basal cell cancer and a squamous cell cancer, or recognize either one for that matter. So a basal cell, like you said, there's a table and there's simple things that we, you know, buzzwords for basal cells. Pearly and translucent, that's a basal cell. Don't get confused with the fact that there's keratin pearls on a histopathology of a squamous cell. So when I was in med school, that really confused me. Leave the histo out of it. If, if they tell you that it's clinically pearly, then it is a basal cell. And that's not, you know, like as you, if as a dermatologist, I know that that's not a perfect truth, but as far as step one is concerned, that's a truth. And then we also think about, you know, they'll describe a rolled border and they bleed easily. And then these telangiectasias, which are branching blood vessels, that's also a giveaway. All of these things, um, you know, I only need to read until pearly and I'm like, okay, it's a basal. What else do you need to tell me? But pearly, translucent, on the nose is a classic location for basal cells and telangiectasis are classic. And then, you know, the nodular growth pattern, that's kind of an extra that they're throwing in there to help the, the, the gunners amongst you, but that's also characteristic of a basal cell. But they also want you to know that it's not a, a squamous cell. And the things that you look for with a squame, as we call them. Can I just interject here really quick? Yeah. So in my mind, the distinction, the thing I had to remember was the difference between basal and squamous, right? Melanoma, that's different. Like, that's a different Mm -hmm. disease entity. I don't think I'd confuse that in a clinical description or in a picture on step one. So in my mind, it was squamous versus basal, uh, basal cell. And so the way I remembered this was the telangiectasias or like like little blood vessels kind of at the visible blood vessels in the lesion. And so they just looked like they'd more easily bleed. Oh. But I don't know if... B? Like bleed B? Basal? Yeah, is exactly. that... Yeah. <laughs> I also... Uh, I feel like, is that is that something that you can take with you on the exam? or Because don't squamous cell carcinomas also have a tendency to bleed or for the purposes of step one, perhaps not? No, they do. But I think that the remembering that telangiectasis will are likely to bleed, you know, and that that is yeah. you know, associated with basal. That's helpful. But if you're looking at just if some if they give you a vignette that has a big bloody lesion, that could be anything. Fair enough. But then you were saying, so for squames, I'll use your lingo. Yeah. So for squames, you know, they're going to describe them as more pink and scaly, kind of like rough textured. That's an actinic keratosis or a precancerous lesion for a squame. And then they also a lot of times on step one would give you the association of HPV virus or chronic inflammation. Those things are both associated with squamous cell carcinomas. And so those are like the buzz associations that you should know. And I think if you know all of those, you'd be set. So like a good example would be the like a person who has some orthopedic, like uh, I'm trying to think like an osteomyelitis, for instance. That... So super common thing is stasis dermatitis. So uh, you'll see a lot yeah, of like yeah. old people with like chronic stasis changes of the lower legs. And then, you know, they'll have it for years and then they start to get kind of like a little scaly area. And that's when, you know, refer to derm. (laughs) Why do they want us to know the distinction between basal cell and and squamous cell carcinoma? One, it's important to be able to tell your consulting uh, physician what you think is going on. Um, Basal cells are much slower growing and less aggressive and less risk of metastases. 
whereas squames can be killers. I mean, they're less likely to be, but, you know, than like a melanoma. But um, a squam, you kind of take a little more seriously, and you'd pro- we'd probably, from a dermatologic standpoint, maybe see that a little faster if you told us there was a rapidly growing squamous cell carcinoma. So that's really the reason that we that a primary care physician would need to know that information. Another thing I would like to say here is the every board's question has to have a vignette, right? They're not just going to ask you what is the most common skin cancer and then list melanoma, basal cell, squamous cell, and probably other ones that exist, right? So how would they ask you or want to test you on the epidemiology? Um, this is kind of a situation that's applicable to other uh, disease entities or, or areas of medicine too, but they could present a vignette that describes essentially a lesion that could be anything, right? Mm-hmm. Could be a squamous cell, they give very general descriptions. It could be squame, could be basal cell. And then ask you which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's condition. And then list the answer choices. And you would pick the one if there were no specific differentiating information within the vignette that is most common. And so you should remember that basal cell carcinoma is the most common skin cancer. But if you, as a dermatologist, I'm sure you get a call from a consultant and they describe you uh, some sort of lesion. Are there commonalities or kind of like a general, that's a perhaps a skin cancer type of lesion that would be common for squamous cell and basal cell, like just a general appearance or are they just like so different to you? Yeah. Like how could they write a vignette that would just like not tell me anything one way or the other? Yeah. I'm trying to think. Yeah, I mean, they definitely could. So, you know, the patient comes in and describes a growing and poorly healing lesion on the left temple, Okay. you know, and then they could show you a picture of something that's kind of pearly, kind of pink and got some scale and, and hemorrhagic crust. That could be either one. Okay. So um, melanoma, like you said, most people aren't going to c- get confused with melanoma. And I think we're going to talk about a melanoma question later because that's super important to be able to recognize and know how to manage. But uh, on, there is such a thing as an amelanotic melanoma. That's the thing that keeps dermatologists awake at night because you're, you can miss them. Um, but they're not going to ask you that on step one. So for step one, if it's pigmented, then you go down the melanoma pathway. If it's pink, then you go down the basal and squamous pathway. Got it. And pyogenic granulomas tend to bleed a lot. They'll be described as, you know, like something that's very vascular, kind of looks like a, like when you look at it, it looks kind of like a red bulge. They show you a picture. And uh, the bleeding is usually the giveaway. And then for a syringoma, just don't even think about it. They'll give that another thought. They're not going to ask you about that. (laughs) So I was thinking. All right, cool. All right. So next, a 55-year-old man comes to the dermatology clinic for an annual physical examination. Past medical history is significant for hypertension. Physical examination shows a dark pigmented lesion on the patient's back. The lesion has several different colors, including tan, dark brown, and nearly black sections. The lesion measures 7 millimeters in diameter and is asymmetric in shape. Which of the following is the next most appropriate step in management of this patient? A. Excisional biopsy. B. Observation with close follow-up. C. Punch biopsy. D. Shave biopsy. Or E wide surgical excision. And the answer here is A, excisional biopsy. Walk us through melanoma and the important uh, features that each of these distractors can help us uh, learn about derm or melanoma. So I think that this question asks a, a fundamental principle that anybody taking step one needs to be able to understand, which is what things raise your suspicion for melanoma. Um, because you don't want to miss this, you'll kill people. <laughs> I always just pray that I don't kill anybody in my job. So the A, B, C, D, E of melanoma, and they give you all of the things here. So it's they tell you that it's uh, asymmetric in shape, that's A, that uh, the border is irregular, that the color has many different colors, tan, dark brown, and nearly black. The diameter is greater than six millimeters. That's the cutoff for things that we worry about. We tell patients the size of a pencil eraser. And then, you know, the E is evolving. They don't talk about the evolution of it in this lesion, but, uh, but that's important to know too. Then the other principle that is so important 
is what do you do when you have a suspicion for melanoma? And this is important in practice as well as on step one, because it's a very easy question to ask about. And it has very clearly studied, like there's a right and a wrong answer to this. And the wrong answer is to do anything that might transect the lesion, which means that you might cut off part of the melanoma, and that would limit your ability to assess how deep the melanoma goes. So when you think about how to to evaluate this lesion, you absolutely cannot pick shave biopsy. Like that is a wrong answer. Like you were talking about, Patrick, how sometimes there's like multiple right answers. Like in this question, punch biopsy could be a valid, depending on the size and the location, could be a valid choice. I will say to shave biopsy is the correct answer, though, if you are a resident and you had two moles that were completely, totally stable for your whole life, but then you wanted to get a tattoo over that area and you thought, well, if these ever transform into a melanoma... I won't be able to tell if it's all tat or, you know, someone was thinking, I won't be able to tell if I get tattooed <laughs> over this. Um, and so you have your friend oh, use a punch Patrick. biopsy <laughs> to remove the lesion in the call room. Oh, my God. And, it, you know, a, a large one, too, like ridiculous. So shave biopsy would be the correct answer if you are trying to get a tattoo over an area and just want something to <laughs> I'm not saying it's me, not saying it's me, just saying in <laughs> If someone, yes. Yeah, if one were to. So yeah, I mean, we shave things all the time. And I want to just give a word of warning. This, this, I think, really tripped me up on step one. What you've seen people do in clinic, when you actually walk into the testing center, just throw everything out. Because I definitely saw people shave pigmented lesions when I was, you know, a first and second year med student. And that is absolutely wrong. So uh, you know, whatever your attending kind of tells you, like, oh, we do it this way here at our clinic. Just like throw that out. Go by what first aid says. <laughs> so why excisional biopsy? Yes. Yeah, so the reason is because you want to get the entire lesion and be able to assess the depth of it. So, you know, I don't really I don't think I really understood this when I was in med school, the difference between excisional biopsy and wide surgical excision. Wide local excision is the definitive treatment for a melanoma. You take five millimeter margins. Excisional biopsy just means you kind of go around what you can see and you cut off deep, like all the way deep to the uh, subcutaneous tissue. So it's kind of like a, a, a wider punch, essentially, but they're slightly different. You know, I think that they're not going to really probably ask you, like we were talking about, Patrick, they might not ask you to be able to really tell the difference between those two, but they do want you to know that you need to cut this thing off. You cannot just observe it, obviously, um, and that you don't want to transect it by shaving it. A punch biopsy, we would usually, um, the problem with a punch biopsy, if you can imagine, depending on where you were to punch it, a punch biopsy takes a little cookie cutter core of tissue. And if you were to punch in the wrong place, again, you might not, you might only see dysplastic cells and not melanot or, uh, melanoma cells, and you might not really get the true depth of the lesion. So um, that's not really ideal. Uh, that's why the excisional biopsy, where you cut the whole thing out and you're really able to look at it under the microscope is correct. All right. What else do you think would be important to know about melanoma for step one? I, I do remember a few like, and these might be more top, like 1% of students <laughs> uh, need to know this. Um, like, um, what about African Americans? Do, do they have a higher incidence of the acral lentiginous? Is that correct? Yes. So that's, yeah, that's right. And so, um, that's kind of like a thing about being able to recognize the melanomas. So um, like if they do give you a person, you know, especially someone who is a like minority racial group and they come in and they have like a funky uh, pigmented lesion on the palms or soles, that's, that's classic, right. the acral lentiginous melanoma. Um, and usually those people have a worse prognosis because they their diagnosis is delayed because people of color sometimes don't think that they can get melanoma. Um, and then people aren't looking at their soles of their feet to make the diagnosis. So um, that is important to, you know, to recognize that on step one and also be able to say, yes, if I were to see that again, I wouldn't just observe that. I wouldn't say, oh, that's probably just a freckle. Like I would biopsy. Yeah, I haven't looked at this. I don't know the last time I looked at the soles of my feet. <laughs> I'll probably probably do that later tonight. <laughs> <laughs> It'll actually freak you. I know that I have like a a little pigmented one on my palm. <laughs> I, I look at it like every night, like, are you turning into something? Are you growing? Well, I don't want to take too much more of your time. Uh, you spent a whole hour as a resident, and I'm, I'm sure that even if 
you are a dermatology resident. Your time is um, still so much, so much not your own. Thanks for having me, Patrick. Check out SholaMD.com and the Med Student Edge podcast. Thank you to Rao Reynolds and Enter Shikari for letting us use the track The One True Color off their 2015 album, The Mind Suite. As always, thanks for listening. If you like what we're doing on the Inside the Boards podcast, please subscribe to our show and leave a rating and review on iTunes. We sure appreciate it. Good luck studying. See you back next time.